So how do we control waste? Well, we already talked about command and control, but said that command and control was done in what I described as a, a, a soft way at, um, using targets, not quotas, when concerning municipal solid waste. How about other economic instruments? The first one here is materials levy. Materials levy is an input tax. So when a company wants to make a product, if they buy something in order to use as an input into that product, and what they're buying is non-recycled, sometimes called virgin materials, then they have to pay a tax, which they don't have to pay if the material they use as inputs is a recycled material. So this encourages uh, recycling because it discourages the use of non-recycled materials. And this is one way of, by encouraging recycling, decreasing the amount of stuff that gets dis de um, deposited into landfills as municipal solid waste. So that's an input tax. Number two, product charge is an output tax. So that's a tax on it's a tax on producers that they have to pay based on how difficult it's going to be to get rid of to dispose of the producer's output once that product gets used up. Next, we have a waste disposal charge, which is not a charge on the firm. The materials levy number 1 and the product charge number 2 were a charge on the firm, on the producer. The waste disposal charge is a charge on the consumer. That's why I said here, a, a user charge. It's a charge on the consumer, the person who buys it. Now, there are waste disposal charges. If you go and dump uh, things at Salt Lake County Landfill, you have to pay a waste disposal charge, unless it's hazardous household waste in small quantities like what a household would use. Some problems is that it's hard to monitor what's in the waste, and therefore it's hard to assess the charge. Now, there are some municipalities that ask you to separate recycles, so recyclables, so they could see how much paper you have, how much cardboard you have, how much steel, how much aluminum. But most municipalities, including Salt Lake County, just have you lump all your recyclables together and it's hard to know what's in there and therefore if you had a different waste disposal charge for different types of recyclables it'd be really hard to assess this. Another really important aspect is that too high of a charge encourages illegal dumping. Illegal dumping is a problem for any kind of technique of minimizing the, what goes to landfills because it's typically pretty hard to monitor illegal dumping. People can you know, put the garbage in their car, drive off in the middle of the night to some rural area and then get rid of, the, get rid of what they want to dump. And this means that if waste disposal charges are too high, then yes, you'll reduce things going to the landfill, but instead they're going to be dumped in natural areas where you really don't want them to go. So enforcement of any kind of municipal solid waste regulation can be difficult, and, and it is made more difficult because illegal dumping is so hard to catch. Um, Finally, in terms of how difficult it is to yeah, how difficult it is to assess the charge, you could charge based simply on the number of garbage cans, and that's actually what is done in Salt Lake County. Another economic instrument to reduce what goes to landfills is a deposit refund system. So let me give you, I, I say here it's a tax and a subsidy combined. So let me give you an example of a deposit refund system, which was market generated, not government mandated. This was a deposit refund system that was around when I was a kid 
in the 1960s and 1970s. So at that time, soft drinks were sold in glass bottles, not in aluminum cans. Glass bottles were rather expensive. So the bottling companies, without any kind of mandate from the government, set up the following kind of deposit refund system. You paid an extra, let's say, five cents or 25 cents for every bottle of soft drink you purchased. And then if you returned the empty bottle to a store that accepted recyclables, then the store would give you five cents a bottle or 25 cents a bottle as a refund. So the, de the word deposit was the extra charge that was imposed at the beginning when you bought the bottle and the refund is the amount of money you got back from the store when or from any store when you brought the bottle back. You didn't have to bring the battle, bottle back to the same store from which you had purchased it. These deposit refund systems went away once aluminum cans became cheaper than glass bottles to use. By the way, what the companies would do when they got the glass bottles back is they would wash them and then reuse them. And that was cheaper for the companies than making new glass bottles. But as I said, uh, by around the time of the 1970s, aluminum cans started getting uh, cheaper than glass bottles. And so the industry switched to aluminum cans and got rid of these deposit refund systems. Now, some governments have mandated deposit refund systems. In particular, I think the, the government of Oregon is one where you have to pay a deposit when you buy a soft drink in aluminum can and you get the deposit back as a refund if you turn in that aluminum can to some state approved place. So most deposit refund systems in the US at least right now are government mandated not market generated anymore. But as I said, uh, earlier systems were market generated. Finally, the book wants to talk about marketable permits. Now, you see I have a question mark here because it's not clear to me that marketable permits are at all important in municipal solid waste. There is some discussion on page 253. The book uh, cites a, a working paper. I don't know if that was ever published. Um, the book is, says that in some places in the U.S. marketable permits are used to regulate uh, municipal solid waste for the paper that newspapers are printed in. It's called newsprint. Also for used oil and for scrap tires. Uh, I'm not aware of any of those initiatives uh, persisting to the present day. I suppose the way it would work is that you could only um, deposit, let's say, a certain amount of used oil in a particular year. And in order to dispose of it, you need to have a permit. And if you want to dispose more than the number of permits you have, then you'd have to buy those permits from somebody else. The thing is, you know, if you, this, this, Stick us with the example of oil. What if you wanted to dispose of more oil than you had permits? Again, with municipal solid waste, there's always the problem of illegal dumping. You don't want to encourage people to say, well, I don't have enough permits, so I'm just going to drive out to the countryside and dump this oil illegally, so I don't have to pay for it, or I don't have to buy more permits. So, as I say here, evasion could be problematic, just as in point three above. S now, evasion, can, of course, it, it's true in point three as well. So, uh, evasion can be problematic not just for marketable permits, but for any kind of municipal solid waste regulation. But I do think marketable permits um, just haven't caught on in terms of municipal solid waste. I also want to discuss something which the book doesn't mention here. I, I call it problems with other non-internalized externalities. So first example, recycling trucks use fuel and they pollute. 
Now, if we had optimal pollution taxes, then this wouldn't be a problem because the optimal pollution tax would be reflected in the cost of recycling. And we could look at the cost of recycling and see whether it was worthwhile or not to 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 to, pol to, to cause the air pollution by burning fuel in or which makes one environmental problem worse in order to decrease the amount of stuff going to the landfill, which makes another environmental problem better. But we don't have perfect pollution taxes, and therefore it's not clear whether having a fleet of heavy diesel trucks going to every single home in Salt Lake County in order to collect recycling is a good idea for the environment overall because it makes air pollution worse even though it makes the municipal solid waste stream smaller. Similarly, if we were worried about exhaustion of petroleum, then the fact that recycling trucks use fuel would generate a concern that they're causing us to run out of petroleum quicker than we would otherwise and that seems to be a bad thing but of course recycling per se seems to be a good thing so it's hard to know how to trade off decreasing the flow of garbage to the landfills which is good on the one hand with increasing the rate of depletion of petroleum or other fuel sources and also increasing air pollution on the other hand so these environmental trade-offs are hard to make because we don't have optimal taxes that tell us at the margin how bad each one of these things is. Uh, next example. Water used to clean recyclables would be saved if the material were instead discarded. So suppose you have a steel can and it had food in it. You're not allowed to put the dirty steel can directly into the recycling bin because the food residue could leave the can and get on other kinds of things in the recycling bin and contaminate them. For example, it would contaminate cardboard, it would contaminate paper. So you are faced with a choice of either cleaning the can before you put it in the recycling bin or throwing the can away, putting it in the garbage. To clean the can, you need to use water. Now, water is a scarce resource. Is it better environmentally or for the society to use the water, to clean the can, to be able to recycle it, or to save the water, not clean the can, and just put the can in the garbage? Again, if we had perfect pricing on water and perfect pricing on municipal solid waste, we'd just look and see which one is cheaper. But in the absence of all externalities being internalized and optimal prices or market or, or you know taxes or the price of marketable permits, it's hard to know how to make this trade-off between saving water on the one hand and recycling the material on the other hand. Uh, by the way, in the real world, the uh, landfills will tell you that you don't have to clean the things that you throw in the recycling bin very much, but you do actually have to clean them enough so that they don't contaminate other things. Uh, particularly if you have paper or cardboard, which can be easily contaminated. Uh, if you have those in your recycling bin, then you, you, you almost certainly are going to need some water in order to clean uh, uh, cans. Now, if we separated cans from paper, then they couldn't cross-contaminate, but we don't do that kind of separation. Uh, finally, one just little clerical note here on page 264, line 1. Change the word paper to the word book. Uh, as often happens, this chapter started out as an academic paper all by itself, then it was incorporated in this book, and the authors forgot to change the description of what they were writing from this paper to this chapter or this chapter in this book and so that's why the word paper appears at that place.